Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast, and I'm very excited to have on Air Force head coach Joe Scott. Now, Joe Scott came to Air Force in 2000 to 2004 initially, and they won their only Mountain West title when he was there. Got him the NCAA tournament a couple of times, the NIT, and then went from there to coach at his alma mater, Princeton, for three years, and then nine years as the head coach of Denver University, and then he was an assistant at Holy Cross in Georgia, where he coached Anthony Edwards, and we talk about that, before he came back to Air Force in 2020. So we talk about recruiting. We talk about prep schools, right? How he utilizes them, how he utilizes the Air Force prep school. Uh, his son went to prep school, and he talks about that decision-making process that his family went through. And we talk about so much more. NIL, transfer, everyone is trying to play at the D1 level that comes to the prep school world, right? It's everyone's dream. And here you get to hear from a D1 coach who's been at every different level and coached at the levels uh, and played. He played in the Ivy League as, as well at Princeton. And uh, it's just a very, very informative uh, conversation with, uh, with a good friend of mine, Coach Joe Scott at Air Force. So thanks so much for tuning in. Enjoy the wisdom he shares. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. Maybe so you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh yeah, somebody wants me. Coach, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Corey. Good to see you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's good having you on here because I want to get a D1 coach's perspective and especially one from an academy's perspective because obviously you're at my alma mater right now, so this, this means a lot you coming on. But the big thing about you I find interesting is you were at Air Force from 2000 to 2004, and you took the program to its greatest heights in history. And after that, you went to your alma mater of Princeton for three years. You went to Denver University for nine years and then had stints at Holy Cross and Georgia all before coming back to Air Force in 2020. So during that window between Air Force stints, like what are some big changes you brought to the program in 2020 that you might not have known or had in your in your chest that first time around? Well, I mean, I think obviously, like everybody says, uh, you know, things change over time. Uh, so to be honest, the things that changed during that time, say 04 to 20, probably was just a little bit related to the nature of the game more so in terms of uh, actually having things go more in those 16 years along the ways of what Princeton basketball, Pete Carrill basketball was our basketball using big men a certain way. We were doing that in the eighties and coach was doing the seventies and nobody knew how to play with big guys and sort of invert them and have them be on the outside and smaller guys on the inside. Now all you do is over the last six, 20 years in those 20 years, you saw everybody start to play that way. You know, I think a lot of it came from the success, you know, we beat UCLA. We then were top 10 in the country in the late nineties. Uh, we went to air force. We won that way. And coach Carrill went into the NBA with the Kings for 15, for 15 years. And he transformed the NBA. And now everything in the NBA all comes legitimately from Pete Carrill. Uh, and he did it his whole career. And now everybody does it. And, you know, just using joke, uh, you know, the Joker as an example. Everybody plays that way. Everybody has those guys. And everybody knows how to play with them and spreading the court and spacing the court. And I think that's the number one thing that happened during that time up until 2020 was – Wow, everybody's doing this. Then you throw in scouting. Then you throw in film. We know we lived in a time frame back then when we were really successful of there was no film. There was no synergy. There was no everybody had access to everything. Today, there's nothing you can do in any way, shape, or form. X's and O's, recruiting, where you're beating somebody, where you're working a little bit harder, and I'm digging in the bushes, and I'm going to uncover. Because everybody's got access to all the same information. And every because of that, Right. Every coach knows what every other coach is doing. Whereas back in before, you know what, if you had certain ways of doing things, you know what, they might not know about them. Uh, no, doesn't exist anymore. So all those things probably opened up the game in a lot of ways. Uh, you had to adjust to that because now everybody knows everything. Uh, scouting so much better, you know, all those things. Uh, so just adapting to that and making changes to what we do based upon 
you know, and I've said this before, we might know how to make adjustments and changes a little bit better because I know the actual starting point of where that action came from. Co we invented it. Coach Carrill, we came up with it. So now all we do is make adjustments to that, but it's all sort of the same thing. So uh, the real changes have occurred since August of 2021, after I came back. You know, those are the real changes. The ones prior, I think, were to the game. And even as I say to the game, Corey, you know this, you played. That's all fine, well, and good in terms of five outs. Everybody's playing on the perimeter. Those changes, court spacing, all those actions that you have to deal with. In the end, the game's still the same, though. It's who's going to get the rebound, who plays harder. You know what I mean? Who plays more together as a team? You know, who has those guys who have their roles? They know their roles. They execute their roles. They're all stars at their roles. The game's still the game once you get between the, you know, the black lines. Uh, because it does ultimately come down to, you know, if we're equally talented, if we're close, then it's going to come down to who's closer together as a team, who cares more, who's got a little bit more character. Uh, so I think some of those things have changed in the last three years because, well, now maybe certain guys, you can't get certain players. You might not be able to do certain things to keep your players. So now your talent is not equal. Your talent is not close enough possibly to have it become about your character or your togetherness, you know, because ultimately no matter what the game of basketball does come down to when people are close and equal, who's got that togetherness, who's more of a team who who's really uh, believes in that. That's the team that wins. Cause that's the best team. Do kids come in with character already, or can you actually teach that? Well, Hey, back in the day, uh, you know, with Coach Carrill, it was a big thing. We always believed, you know what? Every kid had it in him a little bit. You know what I mean? Every kid had something. If he got a, if he got the gene, if he got a touch of it, we can get more of it. Uh, I actually believe today you run into situations where kids are devoid of that gene, and you know you can't produce something from nothing. <laughs> you know, so in recruiting, you do have to today really figure out a way to delve into that. Uh, you know, because again, going back to coach Carrill, uh, we, we played the way we did where he actually, it was a reversal. He knew we were going to get tough kids. We knew we were going to, cause every kid had a little bit of that in them, the way they grew up, there was an inner toughness in there. And we could draw that out. What we didn't have were all these skillful kids. So we went out and recruited guys who were six, eight, six, nine, six, who were a little more skillful when nobody else was, we played that way now today i think it's a complete reversal you got nothing but skillful guys because all they do is have a trainer or whatever and they work on their skills and they're dribbling and shooting threes and doing all those things but they don't play they don't go play pickup they don't play one-on-one -on -one. they don't play two-on-two -two. they don't play other sports they don't learn to have somewhere in there that like competitive drive which ultimately and then the team aspect of being together sometimes they're lacking in that area. So I think that is the, your character question ultimately in sports and in any good business venture, that character thing is the ability of the individual to know he's part of something larger than himself, you know, to be, no, I want to be part of something. And I got to put my individual stuff into this team thing. I may have to sacrifice some things that I want for the better. And I don't know. Sometimes you do. Uh, I don't know. Sometimes if people today have that all the time. Right. Right. That's yeah, that's interesting. Well, let me ask you this without getting into specifics. Recruiting at Air Force, you've only got a small pool out there to choose from, right? Kids that qualify academically, that pass the health test, that even want to do a military academy and then serve five years afterwards. Does having those parameters make your recruiting easier because you can only go after this bunch of kids or does it make it harder because it's a smaller pool? Well, I think in the end, for me, and, and it's always been this way, uh, you know, I'm a basketball coach, so it's got to be about basketball first. You know, I'm not a, I'm not an academic coach. I'm not, you know, I'm a basketball coach. We can put a team together that's going to win, you know, that's, that's our charge. So my first thing has always been, and this was again at Princeton with coach Carrill was I, I can't concern myself when I'm going recruiting with a person's academics. I got to concern myself first and foremost with, does what kind of player is he? What kind of character does he have? Is he our kind of player to help us mold the team to be as good as we can be? Once we identify that, 
right? Now I got to dig into all those other areas that you're talking about. But to to not start from that starting point means we're doing a lot of work, which what are we doing this work for? What does not really matter if this guy's got good grades, if basketball wise, it's not there, you know, and ultimately it's always a balance of that. This guy at the end, we might make decisions of that, that guy. Maybe he, the, he's a little bit better at this and, or more athletic, but you know what? This guy's got more in these areas. So it's a balancing act, but we always start with basketball. Then you get to the academics and all the while through that, you're caring, you're caring about the character of wanting to be part of something greater than yourself, knowing that no matter what the rest of your life, you are going to be on a team and you want that team to do well. And in order for your team to do well, you got to be uh, a team player and sacrifice your own like things that you want for the things that the team needs. And uh, those are basically the three areas that we're constantly, you know, evaluating. And then from that, who's it, what group do we get? And as we call that group, we get to these guys. And then to your point, well, who wants the, uh, to be part of, you know, again, something like, you know, the Academy, something that stands for whatever it stands for. And those are, those are the th- ways that we try to just evaluate it from a basketball standpoint. Now, I'm, I know you mentioned the differences in the basketball in the past 20 years, but like a kid that's coming to the Academy in 2000 versus a kid coming there now, is there any difference in the mental makeup or the mental toughness between then during this 20 year stretch? Yes. What is it? And I just think times change like we started with, you know what I mean? It's 2024. It's not 2000. It's not 1980. You know, it's not 1970. It's, uh, and it's a lot has changed. We know, I mean, we can all, what are we doing right now? We're on this computer and we're staring at each other. We weren't doing this in 2000. People weren't walking around with phones, staring at their phones all day. Kids didn't grow up that way. They grew up completely different and all that, has changed sort of, uh, you know, what, what you're talking about. I think a lot of today, it's a lot of individualism today, a lot of me, 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 me today. And a lot of it is, and I'm not, you know, it's not going to change. It's, you know, this phone, everybody's wrapped up in their own world. You, you, you want what you want right away and you can get it right away. You can go on the phone and guess what? You can get anything you want right away and you can stare at what other people are getting. And you can consume yourself with what other people are doing. And none of that has anything to do with what you're doing, you know, and now that's who you're out there possibly recruiting today. And uh, it, it has made a difference. I think, you know, kids are really the concept of team isn't always, it's can be a little foreign to them. You know, even in basketball, the way things are done today is that they go with their trainer and they're in a gym by themselves and you don't play by yourself. You know, you play with a team, you play with four other guys. There's always nine other guys out there with you. There's never not nine other guys out there with you, you know? So those skills are important. We know that. And like we said earlier, the skills are way better today, I believe. And that's why the game, when you watch an NBA game, when you watch a college game, you see 10 guys out there. Oh my God, look at the skill level. You know, look at the athlete. I mean, it's unbelievable. You didn't used to have that, but I don't know if you get the, competitive spirit if you if you get the understanding of what ultimately the game is when you get between those black lines and what's required from you to win to win is what i'm talking about you know i mean to play okay you might be able to play but to win and to win at our level you got to have guys and for us we got to have guys that are wired that way because without it you can't win you'll be able to play you know you'll be out but you won't be able to win. And ultimately, we know you play because the score is being kept. Right, right. Now, you've got a prep school on campus. So does West Point, so does Navy. And it's 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 a big benefit for you, right? It's almost like a redshirt year. And I went to the prep school there, so I've you know lived it firsthand. How do you decide which players go to prep school versus which ones come straight into the academy? Is that a choice you guys make or is that a choice the admission department makes? Yeah, I think it generally... I don't think it matters, you know, there's nothing to do with uh, Air Force. Uh, You know, prep school historically means something. You know, what it historically meant, which, again, times change. (laughs) It doesn't mean this anymore. Uh, But it generally was a Northeast thing for kids who, admissions-wise, weren't ready 
to go to the school, say they wanted to go. So then prep schools existed to give that kid an opportunity of another year to academically grow, put himself in an environment to get himself ready or herself ready for that school that at that juncture graduating high school, they weren't quite ready for. Could it be, you know, vis-a-vis -vis their admissions office, you know, that schools. I think that's still the case, except you and I now know there's basketball prep schools. And that's not the reason why. And like we said earlier, the landscapes changed in two and a half years from August of 2021 to where there's all these prep schools all over because, well, high school kids need a place to go because they're not necessarily getting recruited by Division I colleges because of all these changes that have been made. And now what I sort of see happening is because it's not about going somewhere to prepare you to go to the place you want to go. It's where can I go so I can go somewhere else? Because they can't at a high school in the sport of basketball because transfer portal dominates, transfers dominate. And I don't think that's going, that's not going away because these colleges, right? They, they got 22 year olds they can go get. They're going to get 22 year olds. And once you go get a kid who played in college and already got coached by a division one coach and played in division one games, there's a big difference. They're not going back to recruiting that 18 year old. Uh, so, but that sort of could be a history lesson of the history of a prep school was about getting you maturity wise, academic wise, head wise, put you in a place to where, yep, you can go to that school now. So as of your players, you're getting straight in, not coming through Air Force's prep. I'm assuming from what you're telling me now, you'd kind of prefer a prep school kid versus a kid coming straight out of high school just because of all the benefits you just mentioned, right? I don't, you know, I think historically that could be the case because you get that. But today, like I just said, I, I get a sense that when a kid goes to quote unquote a prep school, they're just going there to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So me today, I think a kid today, they want to know where they're going. And now if they know they're at that school, they're already at that school. You know, they're in that locker room. They're getting coached by that coach. They have what they want. And now that for us or anybody, does that help that kid? He has what he wants. So he's going to stay there. Hmm. Uh, you know, the, the, the prep school can be something of, they're going there to go somewhere else. They have that mentality. That that mentality isn't what I'm looking for. <laughs> I'm looking for the person that wants to be with us. Yeah. Uh, and that's the balancing act today. And again, like I keep saying, a lot's changed in, in the last two and a half years. Absolutely. Now, personally, you chose to send your son, Jack, to a prep school. What was that family conversation like? Well, I mean, again, I think our decision was based upon at the time we were living in Georgia. Uh, you know, didn't know if that was, you know, didn't know how long we would be there. Didn't know if that was the right. We have an older son who was going through that. And, you know, after being there one year with the knowledge we had, he's a basketball player. Where's the best place for him basketball wise and academically you know that's really what it came down to for him and his development going into his sophomore year what and and due to our experiences we know prep schools yeah. and we know uh you know academically where room where are the places that would be good for growth for him you know that's really what it's about because ultimately like we said Corey, that's what the history of a prep school is the, it, it's a plus supposed to be a place for growth for that individual okay where's the right place for me to go grow academic grow mature and in this case of a basketball player what's a good place where you put those two things together which historically that's what I always you know what's the best basketball school and the best academics what's the best academics with the best basketball that's what you're looking for so in his case that's what you know we talked about and then I just left it up we left it up to him now we have knowledge you know we're from the east coast we knew wh wh where are these mm -hmm. places where that might be good fits for you and you know that's how how we came to that end home run i mean i mean i've always been exposed to those prep schools 
but to have personal experience of knowing what Jack went through. He went for three years, not just one, uh, to be in that community, to be around uh, people of that quality who care about you uh, and you're on your own because he went away from home. So when you put that in there, the maturity level of what you get when you put those three things together, like community, academics, and basketball, quality of people, right? To see growth in three years off the charts when you're on your own yeah. and having to figure things out on your own, no better experience. And I just know, you know, I, Jack's level of maturity, Jack's level of, uh, in the, you know, what uh, independence and maturity and decision making as in graduating high school was off the charts because, well, he had to do it. Uh, and it's not easy to do when you're 15 or 16 and you got to go away on your own. But when you can do it and you have those benefits and you expose your, are exposed to quality of people, and that's something I'm, you know, I, I know that's huge in anything that you do. Who are you, who are you surrounded by? Who are you with? That's ultimately people today say everything's about relationships. As soon as I hear somebody say that today, Corey, I go, oh, what's going on here? Because when you live your life that way, when you know that's what life is, you don't say life's about relationships. You're too busy living it. You're right. too busy being grateful for the ones that you have. You know what I mean? When somebody's saying it, they're thinking about themselves. <laughs> it's not about relationships. Uh, but when you actually live that way and you believe that, then you put yourself around people like that and you're in that community with people you, the benefits you get from that are, are huge yeah you're speaking to the choir on that that's what i tell I families know. every I single know. day and it's good yeah. seeing a coach who actually felt that way too and sent his own son there and then fast forward he ended up choosing princeton freshman year they make that run in the ncaa tournament and now you are in the stands watching this like as an alum as a former coach as a father like what was that like for you well, I mean, it is, you know, it's a great experience uh, for him. Uh, great, you know, during that run to see the, like the Princeton basketball tradition to see, I mean, we actually, you know, almost had, we had more fans in Arizona, you know, when we beat him. Then we went to the Sweet 16. We actually came close to having the most amount of fans there. And somebody would say, wow, how does Princeton, uh, where's the support come from? But what it really is, is, you know, the history of the school from Bill Bradley in 65 and Coach Carrill right after that, you know, you got 35 years of all those alums who, uh, basketball school, it's a basketball school. Yeah. Uh, so I think that showed there and it was just as an alum, it was just really nice to, you know, have the country see, wow, geez, Princeton, man, they love their basketball. And you know, that's a compliment to, like I just said, you know, when you say Bill Bradley in the history of college basketball and you say Pete Carrill and all the success and uh, that we had and the, the games that are remembered by the general public that Princeton played. And I think a lot of that played into that. Uh, but like I said, the history of anybody that went to school, at Princeton, you know, until 2000 was, geez, we're, it's a basketball school. Uh, so. So to have that experience and then to be part of that, obviously, was was a great thing. Yeah, that's so cool. You had to share that with them. Uh, this is a question I ask everybody on my podcast. I'm excited you can answer this. Um, probably 95% of the people that reach out to me are guards. Majority of basketball players are guards. And a majority of them want to play at the D1 level, right? What's it take for a guard to play at the D1 level? Well, I think, obviously, it's always a balance of uh, your skills, your athleticism, your feel and understanding of the game from a guard perspective, you know? Uh, so, and oftentimes, which one comes first? You know, is it the skills? Is it the sense and feel of the game? You know, is it uh, your athletic? It's always a mixture of those three. And ultimately in the end, uh, you know, like, we try to develop guard play, you know, can you develop guard play? Well, guard plays develop by playing, you know, so in order to play and be a guard at division one level, you have to have played and played a lot and been in a lot of situations, you know what I mean? And uh, 
so you you know in some respects like we always say you got to be a gym rat you know you got to like that type of environment you got to be competitive uh you, like i said earlier you got to play one on one you got to play three on three you're constantly putting yourself in five and five environments you're not just putting yourself in five and five environments all the time you're not trying to control your environments you're trying to put yourself in every environment you can ever be in. that's for parents like you said the understanding of basketball is being played at such a high level in this country that you have to expose yourself to those high levels. You have to put yourself in those environments uh, because if you just contain yourself in your environment and you're judging yourself off of your environment, that's not what it takes to play guard at the division one level. You know, like you have to be comfortable in a one-on-one -on -one environment, a three-on-three -three environment, a five-on-five -five environment, playing against these guys playing against the constantly uh and that there's a level of competitiveness there you know what i mean there's a level of uh, awareness there that's required and when i say feel for the game seeing the game well that's awareness and and sense and to me the most important thing is that awareness and sense you know because everybody's working on their skills yeah your level of athleticism will be your level of athleticism where does that sense and feel come from? Where does the seeing of the game come from? And that's ultimately the separate. You got to have all three, but that last one's the separator to say, this guy, he's got what it takes. Uh, so, and you see a lot of kids just struggle with that when they get to college of, yeah, they got the skills, they got the athleticism. I know, but we're out here playing and to play guard. What do you see? How's the team coming together? And your understanding of that is paramount for, for the team to, to make progress. Yeah. And that's a great answer. And then uh, at Georgia, you got a chance to coach Anthony Edwards, who's now tearing it up in the NBA. What did he possess coach that like made him different and special? Did he have it the first time you saw him play? Was he, oh. was he born with it? Was it hard work? What, what was his secret sauce? Well, I mean, first and foremost, you know, when I got to Georgia, the first game in April I went to go see was Anthony Edwards playing at Atlanta Express, nine in the morning, wherever it was. And he was only going into his junior year. Subsequent, he reclassed up that same year. But when I seen him, he was going into his junior year. And I immediately, after five minutes, was like, this guy's a pro. Well, boy, this is unbelievable. This is who we're recruiting. Uh, and it was a combination of, what I just said, but in his case, you know, the level of athleticism that he has is purely functional basketball. It's the highest I've ever, I've ever seen, you know, functional basketball athleticism, the physical strength. He, he's the best cutter, like anything, change of direction, everything about his athleticism. It goes to the game of basketball, you know, then you throw the physical strength on there and then, his sense, his seeing, his throwing of certain passes. I was like, wow, you got that kind of athleticism and you throw those passes. That's when, you know, somebody, uh, you know, is a little different. So, and then, you know, like I told the NBA guys uh, when they would call and ask about him going into the draft, uh, you know, he was always the presumptive number one pick. So it's 16, 17 years old. Your, his kid's going to be the number one pick, you know, what that can do to a kid. Uh, and he was a kid. He was only seven. I said, he came to us as a 17 year old. He was still a kid. He was young for going to college. Uh, but what I thought was most impressive about him, what I always said was, you know what? He's got a good heart, you know, for all the things that were said about him, you're going to be this. He didn't have a bad bone in his body. He's like a, you know, like he, he had a good heart. Uh, he could have walked around thinking he was whatever he could have been a, he wasn't, I mean, he was, he was, he was always enjoyable to be around. Was he young and 17, you know, and sometimes immature. Yeah, but they all, they all are, you know, the fact that he had a good heart, you know what I mean? And not, and, and it was always that way. My thing was just put him around the right people. You know what I mean? Put him in the right environment with mature, with maturity, right? He'll, he'll, he'll take off. And I think that's what you're seeing over these four years is just like sort of that uh, mature growth that he's had. Now you're saying, wow, look how good this guy is in basketball. 
And he sort of put all those pieces together. But how much of that is he born with versus developed through a coach or a mentor? You know, the athletic part, you know, I think obviously a lot of that is, you know, what you're born with. Uh, I think a lot of the credit goes to him and and the people who are around him at such Mm -hmm. a young age in terms of not letting him go off the rails in terms of sort of from my experience of being consumed with himself and thinking everything was about him. And he, he wasn't like that, you know, so a lot of the credit in that one goes to him and the people he was around to keep him sort of, you know, centered a little bit, you know what I mean? And like I said, it's hard to be centered when they're telling you from the time you're 16 years old, you're the number one pick in the draft. You know, that's what I was always, everybody can marvel about his athleticism and I did, you know, uh, but what really impressed me was how, you know, I enjoyed being around him. I'm a, I'm a 54 year old, 55 year old coach. And this guy's a number one pick in the draft. And, you know, there was always just nothing but, uh, a good, good way about him. You know what I mean? And, and that's, I think why he has made the progress he's made. And I think that's a credit to him. And, uh, and like I said, the, the people who were around him when he, when he, when he was making those steps up through the ranks, you know, and for him, those ranks are when he was 14, 15 and 16. I mean, credit to how that happened, because I think he's making these big strides at the age of 22 because of that. Yeah. Well, thanks for sharing that insight. Cause everyone's trying to crack that code. Right. You yeah. hear it in your recruiting too. Let me ask you this. Is it better for a kid to specialize in basketball or how do you feel about that versus like playing multiple sports in high school? Well, you know, I played three sports all through high school. So I'm a big believer in doing that. Uh, can you still do it today? I don't know, but I know, and I've always said this, you know, sports are about competition. Sports are about an inner competitiveness it doesn't matter what the sport is sports about the knowledge team sports right of how do I put my individual skills into this team dynamic so that we do well not so that I do well and you know when you're growing up it might be the you know it could be your football experience that teaches you what it means to be on a team. It could be your, you know, it could be the baseball coach that teaches you what the true essence of competitiveness is. When you just consign yourself to one sport and you, you see this happen and I'm on the same team all the time and I'm around the same people all the time. And I go to the same places all the time over time. That's not good for you. (laughs) You know, it's better for you to be around this group of people. Wow. You know, they, they taught me this then, and then this guy taught me that. And then the more groups around and you learn that, no, this isn't the group for me because they're not doing it the way that. And sometimes if you just pick one thing, you're not getting those different experiences. And ultimately I think what you find out is when you get to be in college, you have better know all those things I just talked about. Right. Because if you do, then you're way ahead. If you understand those things, you're ahead. You will, you will adapt to the coaching so much quicker. You know, you, you will value the things that a college coach and, you know, and I'm pretty certain all of us value the same things. You know, we recognize those guys who uh, understand what I'm talking about and have that level of competitiveness. And, and, and there's a certain joy in that competitive that comes, comes out, you know, because it's a team competitiveness. It's not an eye competitiveness. Yeah. Love it. Last major question here. If everything goes as planned, right, like you want it to go, what does the Air Force program and your coaching career look like in five years? Well, I think at this juncture, we're still figuring that out because all these changes, you know, like these changes happened after I had already come back. You know what I mean? I'd already been back and all of a sudden you can transfer and play right away. Monumental, total shift of the whole landscape. Uh, at a time, like we said earlier, when, well, there's a little bit more of just I, I, I right now, anyhow, and now you can just go leave and go play right away, wherever you want. Uh, so we're still figuring that out along with the, uh, whole, oh, and now you get paid. So now, you know, we're in the mountain West and the level of our competition is so high 
And you know from experience, you know, when we won the first time, we kept all our players because you you couldn't transfer and play right away. You know, and you're in the Mountain West and you're doing pretty well. And you have to sit out. I don't know if you're leaving. You know, today that we're still the 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 data's coming in, you know. Uh so now we got to adjust and make some changes and we'll see as we adjust and make some of those changes to your point, what does that sort of produce over the next two, three years? So we can see in this changing environment, what are we going to do to figure out a way to stay competitive? Uh, and those are the two, obviously major changes that have occurred. Uh, you know, people ask me, you know, what, what, cha- what has changed? You know, what's different now? Uh, that you're back again. Well, there's two things that are different. And I just said them. Everything else the same. It's basketball. They put the same amount of time up on the clock. You know what I mean? There's 40 minutes. They're keeping score. You step between the black lines. The game's the game. You know, it's changed whatever, but it's still the game. What's changed is all the things outside. Uh, and it's changed radically. And in the last you know, 20, 20, 30 months. So does this put more pressure on how you recruit then? It has to, right? Yeah. Well, and even in that, you're not clairvoyant. Yeah. You know, what you really have to be today is, you know, we're going to, we're going to change and adapt in a way where we think it's best to produce what we need, which is in order for us to be successful, we got to get to where we have juniors and seniors. I mean, and that's the third area besides, you can transfer and play immediately. You're going to get paid. And we're playing against 24 and 25 year olds now. And that's not changing, you know, and there's not going to be this reversion in my opinion, back to these colleges recruiting 18 year old kids. They've been coaching 22, 23, 24 year olds who've played 90 college basketball games and they're not going back to taking an 18 year old kid. Once they've had that experience, they'll take a transfer from another school and it's going to stay that way. In my, in my opinion, we got to figure out a way to be competitive given those three things that we got to deal with that we don't do those things. Well, you're up for the challenge. (laughs) <laughs> so that's well that that's that that's the challenge it's changing environment i got to figure out and we got to figure out ways how to change in that environment to produce hey we still got to we still have to be competitive yeah we're going to finish up with some quick hitters here coach all right best player you ever played against who best player I ever played against uh oh you know what i'd say uh, on these, your date, I'm going to date myself, but best player I've played against is probably Sean Elliott and Kendall Gill, two big names. time NBA players. Uh, but played one was at Illinois, played against them my senior year, and Sean Elliott was at Arizona when we played against them. So I'd say those two guys. Who's the best player you've ever coached against? A lot of those. <laughs> is there one that just a guy just lit you up and just you couldn't do anything to stop him? You know, here's a here's a funny story. This is when I was an assistant at uh, U at uh, Princeton. Calipari was at UMass, and we played UMass up there. They were top ten in the country. You know, they ended up going to the Final Four, and they had Marcus Camby. And Coach Carrill, our strategy going in was let can you know like Marcus Camby. He doesn't score. Let let him beat us. You know, make him beat us. He did. <laughs> he had like 30, like you said, 32. We couldn't stop him, but our focus going in wasn't that, you know what I mean? Uh, but I mean, so many, so many guys that we've played against through the years, you know, uh, that were really good. It's more the teams, you know, we beat UCLA when at Air Force the first time we played against pros, you know, uh, Danny Granger was at New Mexico. Uh, so, but the Camby stories, it sticks in my mind as so, he was first team all American. <laughs> oh, I think he was player of the year too. So, you might, right. <laughs> so what was the, that might be a tough one too, but what was the biggest win of your coaching career? Well, uh, they're, they're, you know, I've been fortunate to be part of, you know, 
big games, great games, memorable games. So obviously when we beat UCLA in the tournament, yeah. when I was an assistant at Princeton, that's huge. Uh, you know, and then when we won the Mountain West at Air Force the first time, you know, there, there were some big wins there, you know, uh, in tough environments. You know, we went to Utah and beat Utah at Utah. Majerus was the coach and uh, he might have stepped away a little earlier, but they were like 70 and two in Mountain in Mountain West games at home. Like in the prior 72 and we went there and beat him there and that's. That was something. So, and there were some huge plays in that game. So, you know, those are two that I uh, like, you know, stand out. What's your favorite movie? Godfather. All right. Last one. And then the sting. And then the sting. And then sting. Godfather, right, sting, and cuckoo's nest. Okay. Great. And lastly, when you're not coaching, what are your hobbies? Uh, you know, I try to just make sure, you know, relax. Uh, I'm not a big golfer, but, you know, if certain times of the year, if it slows down, I like to go make, could walk nine. I can't, I, I don't play 18 because <laughs> four and a half hours or whatever. Uh, and then just, you know, as time's gone on, my kids are older, uh, but just sort of spending time with them uh, and, and being with my family and, uh, you know, like to go back to New Jersey to the Jersey shore. So, but sure. It really just make sure you relax and, and, and enjoy your life. You know, that's what I, that's what I try to do is have that balance of relaxing, enjoying my life and still being extremely competitive and uh, in an, an extremely competitive environment. Love it. Is there anything you want to discuss that we didn't touch on the day that you want to get out there for our listeners? No, I think one thing is just what you said. I think, you know a lot about what we talked about when it comes to prep schools and, uh, you know, that, that, that using the prep school for its intended purpose, you know what I mean? Like we talked about and people knowing the value of that, uh, but, but using, using it the right way, you know what I mean? Like going to be in the right place, going to be with the right people for you. Everybody's different. Everybody's on their own sort of path and on their own journey. And I think oftentimes people lose sight of that, like know who you are, be comfortable in your own skin. You know I mean? Don't try to chase what somebody else is doing. Who cares? Uh, and if you can approach it that way, then I think you'll find the right prep school for you. And they're out there. And really what you'll find is it's the right community. It's the right people with the right values for you. Because when you're in those environments that's when you flourish that's when you thrive that's when you get better and i think sometimes people lose sight of that and to have someone who knows that like you and uh those are the important things you know stress those things because those are the ones the things that make you improve and ultimately when you improve you find yourself getting what it is you wanted <laughs> you know and don't chase what someone else has done. And that's a hard thing today. Uh, and if you can do that in that approach, you'll find the right place for you and you'll grow in all areas of your life. You know I mean? Everybody gets consumed with this basketball thing. And let me tell you, the best basketball players are the ones who grow in all areas of their life. You know, the best pros are the guys who there's more to them. You know I mean? They got, a, they, 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 they're, they're alert. They're aware. They know there's other things going on. Uh, so the sooner you learn that, uh, the better off you'll be. And a lot of that goes into picking the right prep school for you, you know, uh, you know, that's going to make you grow in the way that you need to grow. Yeah. Love it. Such great, great insight there. Coach Joe Scott, head coach at Air Force Academy, basketball team, my alma mater. It was a pleasure that you took time out of your vacation to hop on here and share some of your knowledge. So thanks so much for being on today. I appreciate having me on, Corey. Always good seeing you and talking with you. Yeah, if you guys like this, be sure to subscribe on YouTube and all the major podcasting platforms, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.